Did you know the futuristic bubblegum crisis was heavily inspired by the present day of its production? The title itself comes from the fact that bubblegum's era of conception, the late 80s, was a time of economic strain in Japan due to overinflation in the stock market. The asset price bubble, also referred to as bubble economy, affected many businesses in Japan, including the entertainment industry. According to Robert Woodhead, CEO of the licensing company Animago, original concept creator and screenwriter Toshimichi Suzuki once told him that a bubblegum crisis was what happened when you blew a huge, wonderful bubblegum bubble and everything was great until it popped and got all over your face and hair. Series director Katsuhito Akiyama was also quoted saying, The title Bubblegum Crisis was probably coined by Suzuki-san. I am not sure if he did it consciously or not, but this series happened to be created at the height of bubble economy in Japan. I think he had some talent for foresight. In addition to being influenced by its real-world surroundings, Bubblegum Crisis was stylistically and thematically influenced by 80s pop culture from all over the globe. In an interview included with Animago's 2004 remastered release, character designer Kenichi Sonoda was quoted saying, Suzuki brought out the plans for an SF genre film, saying that ladies will be wearing armor that shows their body lines. The first thing he showed me was a promo video for a band called Asia, and it had images of a lady moving around wearing mecha-esque gear. I thought it would be better and more futuristic if she had been wearing a full body armor. The music video mentioned by Sonoda is most likely the one made for the British rock band Asia's song Go, which was released on the 1985 album Astra. Both the album cover and the music video depict a woman wearing futuristic curve accentuating body armor, not unlike the Night Saber's hard suits. In addition to its musical connections, Bubblegum Crisis was inspired by other sci-fi works. Wearing the hats of both designers and writers, Hideki Kakenuma and Shinji Aramaki had numerous influences. Aramaki stated, At the time I had things that I wanted to do. I especially wanted to do an SF version of Streets of Fire. So I did the storyboards to the part where the first boomers were thwarted. Then, Kakinuma-san, who had just seen Aliens, made the battle scene toward the end. So it just didn't come together at all. Akiyama-san had to go through much anguish to sew it all up. A noticeable homage to Streets of Fire can be seen in the very first episode, which contains a musical montage reminiscent of the film's opening scene. Kakinuma added that Blade Runner's success at the time also influenced the production, as hinted at by Pris, sharing her name with Blade Runner's Pris, and her band, The Replicants, being a reference to the name of Blade Runner's Artificial Beings. The one downside to having so many creative influences and directors wanting to leave their mark was that the OVA quickly found itself searching for an identity in the early days of pre-production. Looking back, Aramaki noted, It is interesting to see that we were painstakingly trying to capture and apply the essence of cyberpunk just when that term was starting to be used. Kaki Numa remembers that Suzuki-san aimed at something like a societal drama centered on the evils of industry. I think that Aramaki-kun was aiming for a stylish cyber SF in tune with MTV, and Sonoyan was aiming for hardcore SF. Katsuhito Akiyama also recounted these early days, stating, There was no overall organization of the series itself, so in the beginning, tentatively, we were just going to make one episode. However, after the storyboard was finished, they said, This might turn into a series. So in a panic, we revised the entire storyboard. Did you know that the eight-episode Bubblegum Crisis OVA was originally meant to have more episodes? According to various sources, the plan was to produce a total of 13 episodes, but everything ultimately fell through after episode 8 due to a falling out between the production companies Artmic and Umax, who both worked on and claimed rights to the property. In the end, neither Artmic nor Umax won the drawn-out legal battle. The former went bankrupt in the late 90s, right around the same time Umax, a subsidiary of Toshiba, was reabsorbed into the company due to financial troubles. Thus, the rights to the franchise became absorbed by production company AIC, whose president, Toru Miura, 
had been involved with bubblegum since its beginning. In 1998, AIC brought back several key staff members to produce a reboot in the form of a television series, Bubblegum Crisis Tokyo 2040, to allow for a more coherent and drawn-out story. Despite some mixed reception, the reboot immediately revived interest in the franchise. So much so, in fact, that licensing company ADV wanted to produce a sequel. The ill-fated series, titled Bubblegum Crisis Tokyo 2041, was listed under ADV's active production status in 2002. In 2007, ADV co-founder Matt Greenfield stated at Anime Central that the primary delay was due to the unavailability of key staff from 2040, as many of them were engaged in other projects. Though never officially cancelled, the project faded into obscurity with the closure of ADV films. But aside from its numerous spin-offs, Bubblegum Crisis has been, and continues to be, very influential to other works across many mediums, such as Disney's hit film Big Hero 6, Take It From Cliff, Cliffy B. Blazinski, the designer of the hit video game franchise Gears of War, who informed his fans that the lumbering boomer locusts owe their name to the menacing, inhuman antagonists of Bubblegum Crisis. Thanks for watching. We're Did You Know Anime, the anime trivia resource. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook for all the latest facts and trivia. And I'm Cindy Nichols, the voice of Pris in the English dub versions of Bubblegum Crisis. You can follow me at www.cindynichols.com. And remember, if you don't work out, you won't fit into your suit.